thanks everyone for joining us. It's our last um, public service perspective session of the semester, which is hard to believe we're coming up on the close of um, the 2023 school year. So thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, for the folks that are on virtually, we just ask if you could stay muted throughout the presentation to avoid any disruptions. Um, feel free to drop questions or comments in the chat throughout though, and then we'll take your questions at the end. Um, this session is being recorded along with all of the other ones, and we will make all of those recordings available within the next week um, before we close up on the semester. Um, at this point, I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Anya to be the speaker today. Thank you, Mackenzie. And my personal and professional thanks to Mark, uh, Dr. Mark Lubell, who um, we were in the same cohort at the SUNY at Stony Brook uh, many, many moons ago, but we were joking at the beginning that we both age gracefully, at least that's what I like to tell myself. Mark certainly has. But Mark is, um, I wouldn't take a more than a couple of minutes to introduce Mark. There's a lot to be said. I'll keep it uh, brief. Mark is a professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis. He's also a co-director for the Center for Environmental Policy and Behavior. Mark has published widely multiple books, um, over 100 journal articles, um, many more technical reports, briefs, you name it. Um, over $7 million in grants by Mike Quick, back of the envelope counting as a PI or a co-PI from multiple sources, including the National Science Foundation. Um, he's many things. He's a musician, um, so a um, member of two bands. You can look them up on his website. Um, one is, I believe, the Chicken Tractor, and the other one is Fund Defied. Is that correct, Mark? Yeah, the, the, those are now kind of uh, you know old old versions of bands. So um, all right, my, yeah. So it's all, that's a constantly evolving thing that uh, I don't really keep updated on the web. So all right, call that, we'll call that legacy. Legacy, <laughs> legacy bands. He's a avid angler. Uh, in fact, an, uh, a naturalist, outdoorsman. Uh, ever since I've known him. Um, but if you chain him to a desk, you're going to find him wrestling with uh, a problem that I fully recall um, sort of arrested his attention in graduate school, which was Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons uh, and Lynn Ostrom's work in particular. And that has led to basically defining a large part of uh, Mark's work around cooperation um, in, in a, with watersheds, policy systems. And so the natural outlet for that has been looking at challenges um, in um, environmental policy, agricultural policy in, in particular, but then also public policy more generally. And so today, Mark is going to be talking to us about the quest for cooperation in complex governance systems. So Mark, thanks again, and I turn it over to you. Thanks, Ani, for the stroll down memory lane and also the um, uh, invitation to uh, present to your group. Um, you know, the title is is slightly changed. It, the original is the pursuit for co of cooperation. Now it's the quest for cooperation because you know I think I'm going to go see the Dungeons and Dragons movie tonight. So um, gotta gotta take on a quest. Um, all my information is there. Uh, the Center for Environmental Policy and Behavior. Um, link is there, environmentalpolicy.ucdavis.edu. If you want to see what my group is up to, my Twitter handle is there. I still actually use it, despite the fact that Elon Musk has pretty much ruined it, And but I'm not ready to make the switch to Mastodon or whatever yet. So anyways, all that information is there. Um, get started on the content. So as Ani said, um, uh, you know, the kind of central question that I've been pursuing all the way back since graduate school is basically um, this, uh, you know, how you understand cooperation in the context of environmental policy. And um, this really is inspired by Eleanor Ostrom's work. Um, the theory of collective action is a central subject of political science. It is the core of the justification for the state. That's basically, I would say, basically every project is, you know, has this idea at the whole core of it. And, you know, so I really kind of moved this over into the context of governance and for sustainability, human behavior, complex adaptive systems. All of my research is kind of in that context. And, and today I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, messy polycentric governance systems for water management and climate adaptation as an example of these sorts of issues in action. So um, to kind of orient you, um, this is um, the Bay Area of San Francisco and um, California. Let's see if I can get a little um, laser pointer here. So um, up here is the Delta. Um, 
two rivers come in here, the San Joaquin, sorry, the Sacramento River, then the San Joaquin River, they merge in the Delta. This is kind of where the, the heart of California's water supply and water management conflict, that all flows into the San Francisco Bay. Um, so, and you know, the, the, this is nine counties around here, very urbanized area, very vulnerable to sea level rise, which we'll be talking about. And this right here is uh, the boundaries of a very important collaborative approach to um, water management in California called Integrated Regional Water Management, where they try to get a bunch of stakeholders together to, to solve water management problems in the Bay Area. This is a map of San Francisco J Bay Joint Venture, which is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service program that is designed for uh, doing habitat uh, management for like uh, the Pacific Flyway, wetlands restoration, and stuff like that. Again, bringing bunches of actors together to cooperate in, in that context. And here you see some of the, the, the projects that they're funding under this program, the little purple dots. Okay, here's one called Bayland Ecosystems Habitat Goals. Um, project, and this is a, more of a, a regional project that is tr trying to aim for restoring the wetlands uh, on the shoreline and um, across this area, there's been, a, you know, all of the, the coastal wetlands, not all of them, but a lot of them were lost to development, so there's a lot of attempts to restore that. Uh, here's a subwatershed one called Sonoma Creek TMDL, so this is a, a, a watershed that flows into the bay. Um, TMDL stands for total maximum daily load, and the idea here is to try to get all the actors to work together at the sub-watershed level uh, to solve the water quality problems that are there. Here's something called the Alameda County uh, Adapting to Rising Tides Project, which is a little more um, uh, recent that is uh, oriented towards, uh, it's, a, it's a regional agency called BCDC, that did a vulnerability analysis for sea level rise in Alameda County. So the BCDC, Bay Conservation Development Commission, they're like the big regional agency that works on coastal uh, shoreline development permitting. They have a planning division and they're working on a lot on sea level rise. They're kind of the lead agency around sea level rise, which we'll get to. Here's another one, South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. So this, there's a, some national wildlife refuges down here in the South Bay. And during the gold rush, there was a lot of salt production that drained these wetlands and, and um, uh, used them, you know, dried up the, the water there and, and, and got the salt out of it to support the gold rush. And <clears throat> these wildlife refuges and salt ponds are the subject of another restoration program. Again, all of these are bringing together um, various sorts of uh, stakeholders to try to get cooperation. So in um, a study I did for IRWM, the first one I showed you, this is a study on water management that I did, about, I don't know, nine, nine years ago or something like that. Um, I did a survey of all the people that um, I thought were involved, that I could find that were involved in integrated regional water management in the Bay Area. And within that survey, I asked them this question. There are many different forms and processes available for participating in water management and planning in the Bay Area. Planning processes are defined as forums where stakeholders make decisions about water management policies, projects, and funding. Then I had them list to up to three. And then 58% of the respondents answered this question. Most of them nominated three different forums. So I showed you just then the boundaries of six different or seven different forums that are operating simultaneously in the Bay Area at the regional or sub-watershed level, all of which are trying to get uh, cooperation to happen in the context of, of water management. So this is an audience participation part. You can put in the chat or say it out loud, how many total Using this question, how many total water management policy forms do you think I found using this approach in the, the Bay Area? Ten, Ani writes. Seventy-five. Seventy-five, somebody says out loud. <coughs> Excuse me. Any other guesses? Let's get a couple more in the chat. Nobody's guessing, come on, 20. Any other, one more. Someone said 25, 50, 27. All right, good. So that's, uh, um, as usual, when I 
give this part of the talk, everybody underestimates the number. So when you look at what I actually found, this is what the system looks like for just water management. The blue squares in there are those policy forms, like this big blue square here is actually integrated regional water management. And I entered the system through this portal because that's kind of where I got the list of all the different stakeholders. But all these other blue squares here are different water management related forums and policy processes that are happening simultaneously in the Bay Area. Um, and all these um, red circles out here are different types of policy actors, state, federal, local, local government, state agencies, federal agencies, NGOs, consultants, the whole kind of like mix of different sorts of stakeholders that participate in these forums. And the links here are, uh, are actors participating in these forums. So this is like the reality of um, uh, what you have going on in, I would say, pretty much every single environmental governance and really every public policy system that you're going to ever look at is that you have these very messy polycentric systems. And it is within these polycentric governance systems that you have to try to figure out um, how to get cooperation and learning to evolve to try to, to manage the different sorts of environmental collective action problems that these systems face. So the, this is the reality of environmental governance, past, present, and future, polycentric and fragmented. This is an example of a complex adaptive system. These systems are multi-level and cross-scale, multiple actors, institutions, and collective action problems all happening at the same time. Um, in um, response to that uh, graph that I just showed you in a paper that I wrote, um, the guy named Phil Eisenberg, who was the mayor of Sacramento, but also was the, the chair of the Delta Stewardship Council, so very uh, veteran water policy um, after in, in California wrote, public policy is almost always a mess. Let's acknowledge the inevitable and figure out how to manage a messy situation. And then he characterized the, the um, system as, some, as a structure in which everyone is involved, but nobody's in charge. And managing that's nearly impossible. So that's what he wrote from a um, policy perspective, a practitioner perspective, and then Ostrom at the end of her career wrote to explain the role of interactions and outcomes occurring at multiple levels. We have to be willing to deal with complexity instead of rejecting it. So kind of the theoretical frameworks that I've been developing, the research I've been doing, I've been trying to kind of do the impossible, um, which is to understand how these systems, how these systems work, to grasp this complexity, deal with it, study it, understand the processes that are going on, give practical recommendations about how to manage and navigate those processes. Um, it's not only uh, public policy. So for example, some of the theoretical frameworks that I've developed, like this uh, uh, framework called Ecology of Games Framework, which is kind of a theoretical uh, theory of the policy process that I've developed here. Um, it's been applied to a lot of different cases, including Norwegian handball competitions. So like how they develop talent in Norwegian handball. So I like to you know, the theories I've developed, if they travel all the way to Norwegian handball, I figure out they're doing something good. So um, in this paper on Norwegian handball, they write, there's a need, therefore, for well-developed coordination mechanism, good communication between the key actors involved. So they're facing the same sort of problem on Norwegian handball that we face in environmental governance. All right, so now I'm going to like look at this in the context of um, sea level rise adaptation in the Bay Area, which is really... Um, the, why sea level rise is interesting from a theoretical governance perspective is that it re, climate sea level rise and other climate adaptation problems uh, represent a new collective action problem that these systems that are in place, like that water management system I showed you, now now that system has to adapt. It has to change. Has to change and grasp grapple with this new collective action problem of sea level rise, which is the most important um, climate risk that you have in the Bay Area um, with, you know, wildfire smoke and, and um, extreme heat are the other ones that are coming coming down the line, but sea level rise is the one that they're most concerned about. Okay, sea level rise in many, most climate adaptation problems uh, have interdependencies that um, create cooperation problems. So I've worked a lot with a guy named Mark Stacy at UC Berkeley, and he's an environmental engineer. Um, and he's done a lot of modeling um, of how climate change, how sea level rise is going to influence the interdependencies 
um, involved um, around the Bay Area. So here's three different types of interdependencies. The first one over here is called shared experience. So basically these are um, clusters of communities that have different, similar risks and similar um, um, exposures to of critical infrastructure. And so the, anything that's the same color there, they could potentially learn from each other because they're basically sharing a common experience there. Um, this one's called vulnerability interdependence. So it's interdependence that's caused by the, 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 the how vulnerable a particular area is to sea level rise. So in this example, um, because we're from UC Davis, I insisted that they flood Berkeley. So we simulated flooding Berkeley. And if we flood Berkeley, the, what the model shows here is the regional traffic uh, um, response. So this, through cascading infrastructure, um, processes, you see that if you, one area is, gets flooded, it's vulnerable, it has regional implications and regional costs. And then this last one is called adaptation interdependence, and this is what happens when one area adapts, it has implications for other areas. So in this case, what we did is model the hydrodynamics of the water in the Bay Area. So for example, if we, are, if we, if we simulate putting a seawall and fully protecting Alameda County, it moves water to San Mateo, moves water to Santa Clara, because the Bay Area is like a big bathtub. And so if you raise the sides of the bathtub in one area, it moves water to the other areas. So if you mitigate flood risks with sea level rise in one area, it has these regional impacts at various levels to other, to other communities. In this case, we model it at counties, but we've modeled it at even finer scale too. Um, but so if you take all these interdependencies together, that means there's a lot of potential um, room and need for these actors to cooperate because that they have to account for these interdependencies in their decision making. So on the governance side of things, we've done a bunch of research um, on this particular issue. Um, we started out by interviewing um, over 43 people. Um, involved in the leadership on this from all different levels of government, different types of stakeholders. Uh, we held focus groups in different parts of the Bay to be able to say, um, you know, here's some of the problems we found, what are some of the solutions. Uh, we wrote a report to the policymakers on that. Uh, we did a big survey that, of, of all the stakeholders that we get to get our hands on, kind of like that IRWM survey. Um, uh, Co-author, my really very close co-author in this, Francesca Vantaggiato, she did some on-the-ground case studies. Um, I, I, I sort of do a lot of participant observation or policy-engaged research. So, for example, I was on the leadership group for the Bay Adapt planning process that, that was uh, kind of run by BCDC to come up for a plan for this. And then we have a lot of ongoing research here. Um, Francesca and I have a book that's under review right now at Cambridge on this idea that it's responding to a new collective action problem. Uh, I have some other students looking more at uh, the uh, green infrastructure projects that are going on in on, on the ground, so like on the ground analysis, um, graduate training grant, and then we have some comparative studies going with some other people in different regions of the United States to get a look at, at what this sort of process looks like um, in a compare from, from different places. So here's some information on the governance survey, just to give you an idea of the methods. Um, uh, we we got a 22% response rate, which is not awesome, but it's it's good enough to motivate some analysis. And we had a, and we also had a huge list that we started with, so it's kind of like hard to figure out, you know, how many of the people on these huge lists that we that we collated were actually involved. So I think we pretty much got kind of the core of the network and these responses. And through all of this, we kind of came up with these um, uh, seven keys to cooperation. So network governance, climate adaptation planning, um, funding, integrated permitting, climate science enterprise, civic engagement, it's cut off a little bit there, but political leadership is the seventh one there. And um, what you see um, in the cells there is like after we did some of the um, qualitative research, basically, these are all kind of the different solutions that people came up with at, to all of these main keys to cooperation. Um, and um, in red are the things through the focus group that we, in the focus group, we basically tried to like zero in on the things that seemed like the best ideas. 
So all these things in red are kind of like the best ideas, the, the, the meal that you would pick off the, the governance menu, if you wish. So I'm going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So key one, network governance. So there's many different types of organizations involved in sea level rise. And you see, and this is from the survey. Uh, so lots of local governments and NGOs consulting and research, all the different levels of government of various, of various sorts in there, very little agriculture in the Bay Area. You know, if you did this in the Central Valley, you'd get a lot more agriculture. Um, most of these actors have sea level rise as a regular part of the work, and uh, most of them are involved in behalf of one organization. There's always a handful of people who, who wear multiple hats in these systems, um, but most of them kind of work for one organization. And this is what this is the core of the network that's involved um, with sea level rise. Uh, uh, it's actually much bigger than this, but this just kind of gives you an idea of what's at the core. Again, these blue squares are the forums and the red circles are the actors. So um, you kind of have some of the, at the, what at the time were some of the main regional planning efforts that are happening. And then you have a lot of the main actors here, local um, actors, regional agencies. Here's BCDC, Bay Conservation Development Commission. Um, you know, sort of the typical things that you you get in the middle of these systems. And then this is a map of the um, date at which these blue squares are established. So these blue these forums, you, you know, they they were all established at a particular time. And so, like, you know, I'm from California, so we like to look at the vintage of things. So this you can think of this as like the vintage of these forums. So like the earliest one in that system was in 1998 and then as sea level rise became more and more of an issue um, you see this kind of like cambrian explosion of forms so this is what happens when these systems start to look at a new collective action problem is they create a bunch of new forums and everybody's kind of participating in there and, and cooperation is evolving it's, and the system gets more complex and more messy um, you know that's kind of the reality you have to deal with it it's it's this is actually a good sign uh, because you know in systems that are don't have as much capacity you know the rate of institutional creation is much slower or the institutions that do get created are ephemeral they don't last very long but in the, in these in a high capacity system like California's environmental governance system when there's a new collective action problem those that institutional response is rapid and uh, quite broad. And that's still ongoing. So, you know, this data you can see kind of ends, but that this process of institutional creation is still happening. When you look at, uh, okay, so that's, you know, how, how you, how, one of the keys is getting that, net, governing that network, getting all those actors and forms coordinated. The, sec, the second one is planning. So um, how do you come up with a plan to deal with sea level rise in that context of that messy network governance situation? Um, this is again from the survey, and what you see here is that um, people have a pretty high level of agreement on the risk. They, you know, this is not a place like North Carolina where they may not believe in climate change or something like that, or even banned from using policy documents. Here in the Bay Area, um, you know, everybody pretty much believes climate change is a real thing, and they all pretty much agree that sea level rise is a big risk that they got to deal with. But what to do about it? There's much less agreement. So. First, the problem emerges, then they're like, what do we do about it? So they got to do some planning. Um, so, And then when we ask them of their solutions, they say, well, the number one solution we want is to create a regional sea level rise adaptation plan and build collaboration. But what they don't want to do is establish a new regional authority. So there's absolutely no um, uh, desire, there's very little desire for um, a new governance agency or increasing the political authority of existing governance agencies to do any sort of mandate or mandated cooperation here. So there, it's going to have to be more of a collaborative voluntary effort. That's what's emerging. And given the fact that it's more of a collaborative voluntary effort, the key there is like, how do you get, how do you come up with a plan and then implement that plan so that all the different actions that different actors are expected to take, they actually do them. Nobody's telling them what to do. So 
as far as as far as that goes, what's the big the big game in town right now is called Bay Adapt. Um, this is a regional strategy, um, and this is what I participated in. So after I did the study and I showed you that original network, Bay Adapt did not exist at that time, and then it was created by BCDC as one of the main regional plans that they're looking at. And so Bay Adapt is you know uh, the first attempt to come up with a regional sea level rise adaptation plan. This is kind of the sort of process that we went through. Um, you had a leadership group, working groups, public engagement of various sorts. This went on through, you know, it was virtu very virtual during the main part of the pandemic. So it's kind of going back and forth, coming up with these ideas, coming up with this joint platform that kind of lists all the goals. And these are some of the guiding principles that were driving the, the Bay Adapt. So you can kind of see on the ground things. There's a lot of equity built in. Environmental justice is a big issue with sea level rise, because just with just with all the other climate adaptation issues, more, uh, vulnerable populations tend to be inequitably distributed, and adaptive capacity also inequitably distributed. So to get projects on the ground, you got to permit them. And one of the one of the so the key three is dealing with the permitting. Um, if you're going to put like a green infrastructure or a sea or a gray infrastructure like a seawall, green infrastructure like restored wetlands or horizontal levee or something like that, you got to get them on the ground. To get those on the ground, you need permits from many different agencies that have jurisdiction. So this is just kind of a list in there: local government, BCDC, Army Corps, Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, biodiversity sorts of agencies, um, NEPA, CEQA. Um, so there's like a gauntlet of permitting that at the very least takes a lot of time and, you know, often there's conflicts among these permitting agencies and what they think the right requirements are. So there's just a quote from one of the interviews it says adaptation projects get treated the same as someone putting up a Walmart, we got to jump through the same hoops and it takes years and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get the permit. So how do you, in, how do you deal with that? So what, uh, one way to deal with that is is called integrated permitting, which brings together all the permitting agencies to have a more efficient process. And in the Bay Area, they've done that for a while with dredged materials. So what's happened recently is this thing called the San Francisco Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team, the BRIT team. And what they're attempting to do there is bring all the permitting agencies together to work together collaboratively to issue these permits in a more efficient way and without you know, you can't sacrifice their their their, their uh, administrative and legislative mandates, but you can try to like get them working together before the permit is issued, so that you get the the best, most efficient permitting process. So this is their attempt that's going on for that. All right, key four funding. Um, climate adaptation costs will be massive. If we're talking just the Bay Area. There's some examples. Uh, restoring 100,000 acres of wetlands is approximately 1.43 billion over 50 years. The first part of the Embarcadero Seawall Program, which is that big famous seawall in San Francisco, I bet many of you have been on it, $5 billion. And then a most recent estimate that just came out a few uh, weeks ago says, uh, estimates that um, it's going to cost $150 billion to meet all the adaptation needs in, San, in the Bay Area. And that's that's a crazy amount of money. Um, they also estimate that if the cost of, of flooding is like $300 billion. So from a cost benefit perspective, it actually probably pencils out pretty easily. But still, where do you get $150 billion? Um, there are some things that are happening around that. So uh, there's something called Measure AA, which was um, passed in 2016, which is like a parcel tax. They framed it as wetlands restoration, but a lot of it's around sea level rise. Um, and that's a $12 per year for every parcel. So there's some money coming in locally. Um, Newsom's budget in the governor's office has some more money for climate adaptation. And then the Biden infrastructure uh, legislation of various sorts, the Inflation Reduction Act and, and whatnot, there's money for um, uh, adaptation in there that a lot of local governments and regions are going to be chasing if the, if they can figure out how to navigate the federal um, grant process. So here's some kind of data on the money there um, and some of the things that they're spending money on in out of major AA. So you see a lot of wetlands restoration, levees, public access, different things that they're spending money on. There's a there's something called the um, uh, 
San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority that's kind of receives all this money and spends it. And here's some of the different types of projects that they're doing, marsh restoration, um, visioning, Spartina removal to invasive species, some social stuff, Leadership Academy. This is an EJ project. That's just an example. Okay, then key five is the science enterprise. So to be able to deal with all this decision making, you got to have identify the best available science. You know, how much sea level rise is going to happen? Um, where is it going to happen? Um, how is it going to interact with um, uh, flooding? Or sorry, with uh, uh, like extreme storm events, because uh, it's kind of sea level rises. You can kind of think of it like um, the uh, like building a uh, a bonfire. You're you're building up like the the wood in is sea level rises like the wood, and then extreme flooding flooding or extreme events like the the match that lights the fire. So it's like interaction between um, the uh, you know, king tides, high tides, sea level rise. Um, and like a, a, hot, a high precipitation event like we had in many atmospheric rivers in California this year, um, those things combine to come up with the flooding that might happen in a particular place. Um, so how much of that is happening? What is the, what, how is that, how are sea level rise going to affect things like groundwater, mobilization of toxins? Um, and then what are some of the best adaptation strategies to be, that you can put in place to deal with it? Um, so, and then we, given that science, there needs to be translational capacity. So it's not like every local government can, understands how to deal with this type of data. So for example, you know, one of my, uh, county, uh, a leader in one of the counties said to me, you know, last thing we need is another portal, right? Another website that we're going to look at and try to like figure it out. They need help translating that science into on the ground action, the linking knowledge to action part. So there's there is a lot of science NGOs that are out there in this in this ecosystem of actors. San Francisco Estuary Institute, um, the state of California has sea level rise guidance. There's this thing called an adaptation atlas, which lays out all these local planning units and that have different sorts of vulnerabilities. So that ecosystem is quite robust. The universities are part of it. I'm part of it. Um, but that's you know getting the science right is always a key. But you can't do any of this without political leadership. Um, you know, it's the politicians at various levels that really kind of push this along um, from at the state level, within the legislatures, within the agencies. So you have um, legislative member organizations, like select committees in the legislature that get together to work on climate adaptation, sea level rise. Um, we have the governor paying attention. Um, at the local level, there's some county uh, supervisors, um, some other, you know, like city council members, mayors that are kind of taking leadership on this issue. And then you have a lot of NGOs that are working on this issue that are forming networks among themselves to kind of like both deal with their own local issues, but also deal with um, like working together at the regional level. And the rate at which this stuff is happening is definitely increasing. So there's a association that kind of keeps track of the um, all of the different legislation. And all of this is AB is Assembly Bill, SB is Senate Bill. Those all uh, bills in the California legislature that they are tracking that have some type of impact on um, climate adaptation. Um, some of them are more narrowly focused on sea level rise, but there's just kind of this uh, accelerating amount of legislative action on this. And then the last key is community engagement. Um, uh, you know, I, when, as, when you talk to elected officials, especially at the local level, they're like, well, we don't really care too much about sea level rise unless our constituents care about it and are telling us that we should be looking at it. Um, but getting people um, tuned in to sea level rise and engaged in sea level rise is tricky. Um, because it's what uh, um, it's a psychologically distant phenomena. So that in the adaptation in climate change literature, when you think about the public opinion piece of it or the risk perception part of it, there's this concept of psychological distance. How far is it from the individual in a sense? And um, it, on this graph, this is from a different survey of a household survey that we did. So this is um, you know uh, people's 
household in the Bay Area, their risk perception, how much is sea level rise going to affect me personally? How much is it going to affect me in the Bay Area, the U.S., developing countries and in the future? And you can see that in general, people are less concerned about it. Um, uh, the, the most psychologically close part, they're less concerned. The more psychologically distant things get, developing countries in the future, they feel like that's where the impact is going to be. So how do you move it closer to the individual, reduce that psychological distance is a key piece. And if you look at these two, two graphs, you can see that um, these are the people who supported that major AA. They voted yes for that parcel tax. These are the people who opposed it. And you can see the people who supported it, sea level rise is a more psychologically close. It's less distant from them than the people who opposed. So that engagement with the slow moving natural disaster is key, but it's also, you have to think about the environmental justice piece of it because these risks of, uh, are inequitably distributed. So frontline disadvantaged communities are more vulnerable and they lack that adaptive capacity. And, in, and there are a lot of NGOs in the area that are like, um, you know, rise South San Francisco, um, uh, the West, West Oakland West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. Um, these sorts of um, NGOs that are working on environmental justice issues throughout the Bay Area, sea level rise is one thing they work on, but they are often organizationally strapped. Um, it's in terms of their resources. They they need more resources. Um, it's they're fragmented. It's hard to get them to work together sometimes. Um, they also face many intersectional issues. So that's like one of the big deals with climate adaptation and in, in, in environmental justice and disadvantaged communities is like sea level rise impacts all these other issues that they're dealing with. So they really have to deal with housing, jobs, homelessness, you know, um, crime, education, all these issues that these NGOs work on, uh, toxics, you know, air pollution, local air pollution, they work on all of these. And then you throw a sea level rise into the mix and, they're, and, and when they're already lacking capacity, it makes it a very difficult uh, uh, challenge for them. So getting those communities engaged is key, not only to advancing the things, but also for addressing the equity issues. And here's some of, map, some of the maps of the vulnerable communities. So there's a lot of work. This is from the um, adapt, uh, uh, sorry, um, Bay Adapt process. So kind of looking at, you know, the vulnerable communities, how they overlay between the flood risk and the social vulnerability, how you measure that. Um, and there's a lot, you'll see in a lot of climate adaptation, regional projects, state level projects, there's various attempts to measure social and environmental climate vulnerability. And that, you know, that measurement of social vulnerability is actually something that's, I would say, like under debate, what's the best way to do it? You know, you'll see many different ways of assembling census data in various ways to get at that. All right, so I went through um, kind of all the different seven keys there, network governance, planning, permitting, funding, science enterprise, political leadership, community engagement. Um, this is kind of my grade report that I would had for the Bay Area around this stuff. You know, I think the Bay Area is doing better than a lot of areas as far as uh, making progress on these issues. Um, you know, it's definitely not uh, A plus because this is a really difficult issue to deal with. And um, I, I don't know if anybody can really get an A plus in these issues, but um, it's, you know, they're making progress. I kind of downrated this to B minus given this, this funding issue with the latest estimates of 150 billion, that's a huge number. And there's no way that we have any of the, you know, we're, we're not even close to having um, the uh, revenue identified for, for reaching that number. So that's going to be a, a very difficult issue. Um, but anyways, we're moving forward in all these different, different ways. And just to conclude, you know, climate adaptation requires cooperation. There's lots of interdependencies that you have to deal with. It's occurring in these very messy systems. Um, so you dealing with the, these, how you get cooperation in these polycentric systems, I think there's seven key things you got to look at. 
uh, that are related to governance institutions and human behavior. We went through all those seven keys. It's like the quest, right? It's like when you go on a D and D quest, you have to like get a little different items. So it's kind of like that. Got to get the get the sword, get the shield, all and whatnot. Get the scroll. Um, and then lot, lots of things are heading in the right direction in the Bay Area, but the question is, is it fast enough? Um, given the fact that sea level rise is coming, there, that we can reduce carbon emissions to zero right now. We have centuries of sea level rise most likely locked in already. So sea level rise is coming in the Bay Area. It's not even the worst. I mean, the, the East Coast is, is way worse as far as the overall risk. And then of course, other places in the world, island nations, um, whatnot, sea level rise is like an existential threat right now. Um, but is it, so is it going fast enough? Is it equitable enough? Um, these sorts of challenges, I think, are ubiquitous. Um, I, I would argue basically all environmental governance is like this, but I, I would say every climate adaptation issue I can imagine has these different sorts of interdependencies that you have to deal with that requires cooperation and learning in these messy systems. Um, and in order for us to understand it as policy researchers and doing policy engaged research, we we need way, way more um, comparative and longitudinal research. So you saw a little bit of overtime stuff and what I showed you by looking at some archival research and whatnot, but these systems evolve over very long periods of time. They go through cycles of cooperation and conflict, the processes of institutional creation, birth and death and change of these institutions. Um, how that evolves over time is, I would say, largely unknown still. And also um, it changes in different places. So if you go to, you know, we've done some work like this in Argentina and Argentina is more of a weak institutional system. And what you see in a weak institutional system is like these forums, they get created, they hang out for like a year and a half and then lots of them disappear. So it's like, you get this like ephemeral institutional growth in, in, a, in some developing country, weak institutional context. In California, you have a strong institutional context and it's like you get forms that never die. <laughs> They're born and they never ever die. They may change, but they somehow hang around for a long time. So the system just keeps getting complex. So how that, how that happens in different regions in the US, given different political cultures, different regions of the world, we need a lot more research on that before we really understand how these systems are changed and evolved in different contexts. And, and if you believe me that this is what really environmental governance is about, you know, research like what I'm doing has only really touched the tip of the iceberg, the very, very tip of the iceberg on trying to understand some of this. So it's kind of like opening Pandora's box, or I don't know, is there some D&D &D equivalent to keep that, that metaphor going? You know, you open some box and a bunch of like evil spirits come out and you got to bite them off. Um, whatever, um, something like that we can think of. Um, so that's it. I'll thanks for listening. I'm happy to take any questions you might have, and hopefully you found it interesting. I, I certainly have some, but I'm going to defer to the folks in the room um, and then the folks online to go first. So this is super duper interesting, but how do you see some of these same interconnections and the way that folks work together differing in an area with a high percentage of climate change deniers? Excuse me. Well, I mean, first of all, they got, you know, if a lot of the experts that work on this, even in a place like North Carolina or something like that, they themselves typically, um, Kind of are bought into it, but communicating it to political leaders and citizens is is a different story. So they have they can't really talk talk about climate change, so to speak. It's more like changing weather. Hey, you've seen flooding increase. So stop, you know they try to try to avoid attributing it to climate change while still working on the same problem. So that's that's part of it. Um, you know, I think the rate at which these institutions are created is is likely slower in those regions, um, and just doesn't get as much kind of resources as you see um, coming into some of these forums that you that you have happening in the Bay Area, like Bay Adapt. You know, got a lot of attention and a decent amount of resources from some of the leading organizations. Some people would argue not enough, and of course, implementation is a going to be an ongoing challenge, but. Um, you know, in some of these other regions, um, you don't have that level of kind of institutional emergence.
I'll go next time. Mark, thanks so much. I talked about the, I really appreciate the, the richness of this presentation and, and the, your embrace of the complexity rather than the desire to simplify it um, so that it fits in, <laughs> in the ways that we try to make sense of the world. Um, I was particularly taken by the, <clears throat> um, a question about your kind of framing and maybe a continuum of the interactions that you're seeing. So you said, for example, on um, in the Bay, the adaptation interdependence. So action in one part of the Bay has implications for the other. And then a couple of times in your presentation and also right up front on the, the lab website there, you put this in the context of conflict around natural resources and environmental uh, issues. So where in that kind of from interdependence to conflict do you find the preponderance of this discussion and the advantages of framing in those two kind of different ways? And I ask that because um, in, in a variety of, of efforts, particularly focused international, but also domestic, this question of adaptation for whom and the power inequalities that you're highlighting from the EJ perspectives, but um, not even EJ, right? Some of those different communities you talked about are all kind of at that scale are, are all well to do, right? But their interactions affect each other. How do you, um, how do you A, characterize what you're seeing in response to this interdependence when it is conflictual and is conflict an appropriate term? And um, do you see, uh, can you point to places where that, um, uh, some of these on the ground practice efforts are productively embracing um, the need for a just and peaceful transition as opposed to uh, kind of just, well, we're local and we're just going to pay attention to ourselves. And, and you know, some of these inequalities as they affect others aren't something that we're going to trouble ourselves with. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> I don't, you know, there's a lot of ways to approach that question. And, and I don't really honestly think there's a completely cut and dry answer to this from a conceptual perspective. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'll, 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 I will say that, you know, in some of these central forums in which I have been participating, like Bay Adapt, like the Charge Network and some other of these big blue squares you saw in that, they are definitely approaching this from a collaborative perspective. They're thinking about where can we find ways to work together that have mutually mutual benefits. And in Bay Adapt and some of these other ones, they are, at least here in the Bay Area, aware of these environmental justice issues. Um, they are making steps to include these communities in the governance processes. Um, those communities are not always satisfied with the extent to which they're included. I think it's getting better over time. Um, even in Bay Adapt, you know, those communities were felt like they were not engaged early enough or at a high enough level in the decision making process. And there's a lot of kind of conflict around that. Um, when it comes to like local on the ground projects, which may be closer getting the heart of your question. I would say that um, there's an emerging awareness of these interdependencies and the way it's being used right now, like the sorts of uh, um, graphs that, that I showed you, it's basically being used as like a heuristic to say, hey, look, we're interdependent, we gotta work together. We're, but it's not really being used to say like, all right, we need to do a project here because the water's gonna move in this particular play way. So it's not at the level in the policy discussion, or I would even say in the science that we're at the kind of like, we are prepared to say, here's a place that if you protect this place, you're going to get a lot of regional benefits. And we can not maybe if we don't, if we don't, and, and like channeling our investments in a way to deal with those interdependencies. And so a lot of the, um, I would argue a lot of the local jurisdictions are kind of like going with what you kind of said. They're kind of like doing what they can to protect their own backyards, and they're not really um, considering those interdependencies in uh, at that level of resolution that it could potentially be done. And even in Bay Adapt, 
like some sometimes the science that we did or even they adapt it was like you know as soon as it, that those maps of interdependencies came out they're like well maybe you know you've got some pushback from local government saying don't you can't stop us from doing it just because we may have some negative effect right we there was kind of a desire not to stop people from going forward it's like we're not going to stop people from moving forward right now um because we're trying to work out these interdependencies that was one of the principles that was really actually directly built into Bay Adapt. So that's kind of the, the level I would say that we're, we're at as far as like the extent to which those interdependencies are being considered and brought into these discussions at the moment. Thank you. Mark, we have, a, we have a question in the chat. Uh, sea level rise isn't being prioritized for adaptation funding in California the way that drought and water supply is. Yet sea level rise is ultimately a larger threat for displacement of vulnerable populations. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, well, I mean, I don't know if I would fully agree with Deirdre, who I know for a while, as far as you know, drought and water supply and versus sea level rise as far as displacement goes, when you think about you know, places in the Central Valley or Imperial Irrigation District or something where they're likely to lose a lot of water one way or another. Um, and therefore, you know, those agricultural communities and rural communities that rely on that water are going to have some climate migration of various sorts. Um, you know, sea level rise, there's a lot more people in those urban areas. Um, and, uh, you know, our, I guess not even arguably, but definitely a lot more money at risk when it comes to the amount of critical infrastructure and economic activity in the coastal areas. Um, so, but, you know, I think that one of the reasons you get more political attention to drought and things like that, and it's just like, more, it's more psychologically obvious, right? It's more salient to people. It just, you know, we just had seven atmospheric rivers. Um, that sort of extreme precipitation. But before that, we had, a, you know, four years of drought. And that's like way more obvious to people than this slow moving natural disaster sea level rise. Um, drought affects the whole state. Sea level rise is more regional. So I think there's some like differences in the spatial and temporal time scale that translates into the amount of how salient these issues are from a political perspective. Thanks, Mark. Any other questions online or in the room? Anyone? Yeah, I, another one back to the back to the beginning, Mark, and uh, really appreciated um, your comments about Ostrom, and we obviously really lean into that in the curriculum here and with the students, and so it's always great to have um, folks who, who kind of situate their work, setting that context. Um, you know. Ostrom's genius was really finding the kind of alternative to the limited tools that Hardin told us we had to tackle these problems and, and the, the kind of effectiveness of the grassroots and bottom-up um, uh, uh, efforts. Do you see, uh, at, at the same time, you know, whether it's some of the fisher folk work that she pointed to or the forest management work that she pointed to, they still were often at kind of very ecosystem level um, specific geographies. When you take those uh, kind of principles of cooperation that, that she's emphasizing, do you see when we start to scale up the adaptation challenges to higher levels that go across these geographies, do you see uh, optimism that we'll be able to uh, kind of have the benefits of that diversity of efforts, or do you see uh, limitations in terms of, of, the, of the ability to operate both at scale and at speed that are required as we face these big challenges? Well, I mean, I am optimistic in the sense that, um, you know, you see a lot of bubbling up of cooperation in places like the Bay Area, at least. Um, that's kind of what you see that institutional explosion. Uh, but, you know, Ostrom, you know, part of what you're getting at is, you know, Ostrom's original seven design principles were at this kind of like very local level, right? Like a small fishing community or a lake or something, you know, irrigation system like that. So there's, there's always been a question 
um, and a criticism of her work of how that scales up to regional systems, be it, you know, I guess I would say it first started ecosystems, but now we're talking about like, you know, these regional adaptation systems. But at the end of, end of her career, right, she, she basically, I would say, left us three, you know, to continue the D&D, she, you know, three, three gauntlets that we have to pick up and uh, uh, deal with. One is polycentric systems. So she wrote, she wrote that piece on, uh, you know, about polycentric governance of the climate, climate, climate system that's been cited now however many thousands of times and with the argument that we can't be just looking at the Paris Agreement or whatnot, but we got to think about all the different kind of the polycentric system, different levels of action that are happening. And that, that I would say is a pretty optimistic piece. Um, at the same time, she also said um, institutional diversity. It's not one size fits all, right? There's the, the diverse sets of institutions that are in place. It's like you need lots of different things that are out there, different species of governance forms that are, uh, uh, you know, well suited for different sorts of purposes. And you definitely see that in these polycentric systems, that these polycentric systems are kind of like a brain with forms doing lots of different things, some science, some funding, some mixing all of that together. So that. That institutional diversity is there, and I would say is a, is a positive aspect of the system. And then the third thing that I would sit on, that she left us is like there is no panacea, which is related to institutional diversity. So there's no one size fits all solution. So you know how these systems evolve in different places for different sorts of problems. We got to be able to grapple with that complexity and really figure out how to navigate it and and um, like foster. It's it's really a, it's kind of like I think of it in terms, of, you know, it's like instead of a policy recommendation, that's something like um, we are going to give this species right here what what you really want to do, like a very specific policy tool or something like that. What you really want to do as a governance person is come up with ways to um, accelerate and catalyze the evolution of these cooperative polycentric systems. Like, how do you get them to engage in a collective process of governance where learning and cooperation is maximized and you just get as many of the benefits of those systems as you can, avoid some of the challenges and barriers, find ways to overcome them. And that's kind of a different way of thinking of what your role is as a policy analyst, because it's lots of times to pass this piece of legislation or pass this local ordinance or whatever. And, and that's part of it, but that's what this sort of work that I do is, is different in the sense of like, how do you like advise people in the field on how to maximize the benefits of these of the evolution of these polycentric systems, which is what is happening, no matter what, no matter what you wish, this is happening. So how do we grapple with it, harness it, steer it in the most productive way? That's what I believe is kind of what Ostrom left us with at the end of her career. All these big, these three gauntlets, those are the things she left you know, that she was kind of working on literally when she passed away. Actually, she she was publishing on this after she passed away, which is amazing. You know, stuff was still coming out that she had written. Um, but those are the three kind of um, like left, you know, thing, agenda setting items that are on the table from her, her work that we really need to grapple with both from a theory and research perspective and then an applied perspective, because this is the reality. This is what people are dealing with. And if we don't, as researchers, policy researchers, give some people some help to do that, then we're, in my opinion, we're kind of failing our failing our job. Thank you, Mark. Um, we're, we have less than 40 seconds left, so I want to again <laughs> take this opportunity. I, I, I think we could stay and, and talk. I'm sure there are many more conversations, both online um, and in the room, that people wish we could have. Maybe we'll have you back if you'll, if you'll be willing to come back, but thanks once again. Sure. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to do comparative research like this on other issues or other regions, let me know. I'm happy to 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 collaborate and figure out ways to uh, to do this sort of research in in different contexts. Because the the more that we have research like this out there, um, you know, the more we're going to learn about these systems. So so thanks a lot for the invitation and the questions. Super fun, and hopefully we'll cross paths in the real world someday, Ani. Yes, we will. All right. Thanks again, Mark. You have a wonderful weekend. Yep. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Thank Mark. Everyone have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.